Okay, so this is the settings that I use, uh, that I keep it in for my default. It applies to basically most of what I shoot, so it's kind of nice to know that I could just bring it up, turn it on, and click go. Kind of like the iPhone. First of all, I set the aperture to f4, and that's because at f2, it is a little bit soft on the edges of the frame. So if you're doing kind of a close-up portrait where the face kind of fills up, it tends to get a little bit soft. And what I noticed is that you don't really need that much blurriness in such a close-up range because the closer you get, the depth of field gets smaller and smaller. When you're kind of farther away, maybe five to 10 feet, F4 still gives a nice kind of a blurry background-ish. And like I said before in another video, I tend to like a little bit more environment. So basically it's one of the three things that I might adjust outside of just turning it on and shooting. The other thing is, that I might adjust is the exposure compensation dial here. If you have a brighter background and your subject is a little bit in the shade or whatever, then you know you can always do this. The other thing that I might adjust is the focus point. What I do here is I keep it in this zone focus so that I can somewhat control the area that I want in focus. You could set it to single point and you can make it really tiny if you want to pinpoint. But, you know, that gets a little bit tedious trying to go from here all the way over to here if you want to switch it. You can also set it into wide and tracking, but this is just like, it'll get the best contrast point. That's a little bit not enough control. This is just the right amount of control that I like. Okay, so when you turn on face detect, say your focus box is to the left, but you obviously see the face on the right side. What it'll do is instead of staying focused on the left box, it'll automatically track faces. So it might be over here, the face might be over here outside of the box, but it'll automatically track it and so it'll lock on. And so that's what I find uh, is very convenient about keeping it in this zone focus. I do a lot of portraits and so I like uh, the automatic face attack and it doesn't matter where the box, the focus box might be. A quick tip about the face detect, you might have more than one person in the frame. It might lock onto the wrong person. Say I want to focus on this kid and not my daughter here. You can see that it kind of tends to favor uh, the clearer face um, because he's facing sideways, it doesn't lock onto him as much. What I do is I actually just kind of put my finger over so that it locks onto here. I'm half pressed right now, so it locks the focus and then I just shoot there. And that's a quick tip. You just kind of put your finger over where you don't want to lock focus and then it'll, it'll lock focus onto your box. Oh, and then uh, what I do is also I keep it on auto shutter speed and auto ISO, which is when you lift up the dial, you can change the ISO to manual if you'd like. This is kind of one of those manual slow things, um, but what I like to do is keep it on auto for the most part. In terms of uh, custom custom buttons, um, what I do is uh, for this function button, I set it to my ND, the ND filter on and off. It's one of those functions that you, if you need it, you need it quick. You don't want to sit there and kind of dig through the menu system to find it. I do find it useful to use it in very bright settings, um, especially if you want to shoot at F2. It's a physical mechanical ND filter. Uh, you don't even see it until the ND filter is set to there. Um, I have the wide tele and off. And I don't have the wide conversion or the tele conversion. The only reason why I set it to this button is because sometimes I do use uh, this anamorphic adapter, which is kind of a beast for this camera. I wouldn't recommend doing it too much because it's so heavy. It, the weight of it will probably wear this down over time. But it is kind of fun to play with with an anamorphic adapter. I might get into that in another video. But when I do that, Somebody told me a trick because you'll get slight cutoff in the corners. I know people call it vignetting, but it's actually cutoff where it's physically showing up in the corners. You can crop that out or you can fix it in post or a trick that somebody told me was um, you can hit wide. If you convert it to wide, then it just kind of fixes that pin cushion or barrel distortion or whatever. Um, and the corner cutoff just goes away. And then uh, what else do I have? The right button, 
I have it set to white balance, the down button. I have it set to the change autofocus mode. I don't really use that that often. I just kind of tend to keep it on there. And the left button is the film simulation change. Here's the menu system. Whenever you hit menu, it always defaults to my menu. And so you can add whatever functions you want to my menu. And so I kind of actually set this up where I don't really go through the menu system that much because it's such an automatic thing now where I just turn it on and shoot, turn it on and shoot. Okay, so the first one, ND filter. But again, I have the function. I don't even use that in the menu system. I guess I left it there in case I needed to switch this out to a different button uh, for whatever situation. Uh, wireless communication. Actually, uh, that one's good. Also, something that you kind of want to access quickly, fairly quickly, if you want to do live shooting uh, or remote shooting through the app on your iPhone, or you know, if you want to transfer files or whatever. Um, shutter type. You can do mechanical or you can do electronic, which is completely silent. But mechanical, uh, again, I leave it on mechanical because sometimes I do use flash. And when you want to use flash triggering, uh, you do need to be on mechanical shutter, uh, not electronic. Okay, so face detection setting. This is uh, something that I set into my menu. And you could do face on, eye off, face and eye auto. And you can actually do left or right eye. Um, and then of course you could turn it off. I'd imagine I would have put the eye on. I can't remember why. Again, I haven't gone through this menu system in a while. Or I wonder if I left it off because it might slow down the autofocus a little bit. It's hunting for the face. If it's also hunting for the eye, maybe it does slow it down a fraction of a second. There it is. Film simulation. Here's the film simulations. You can do all of these settings. Provia. You've got your colors and your black and whites. You can also do these color filters and that basically simulates putting a color filter onto your old film camera. It's just one of those legacy things. For example, red, if you take a black and white photo and you take a picture of the sky, uh, the blue sky will turn black, um, very dark, and the clouds will stay very white. And so you get that great contrast with kind of a red filter over over your black and whites. Um, but what I like to do is keep it on classic chrome. This camera is really meant for stills, for pictures, but I started to play with some of the video uh, functions and the video, it's so automated that, you know, you wouldn't really use it for mainly video focused application. But like I said before, I started to mess around with it uh, for Instagram stories and short 15 second videos. The cool thing is you can, apply these film simulations directly to the video. You could actually get some pretty cinematic looking uh, footage with this camera. Here, I set it here so that I can get access to 1080p at 60 for some slow motion or some 2398 or 24p if I wanted to do just regular stuff. You can quickly change to the video setting uh, by clicking this drive button. So here you are in the stills mode and then click drive and there's a movie right there. So basically what I do is I just hit this button twice and it's that quick, I'm in video mode now. Going back is a little bit longer because you have to hit up and then down. But going from stills to video, all you do is hit this twice, the drive button twice, and then hit OK. So here you go, this is stills and now you're in movie. So, and now you're in stills. So it's, it's pretty quick. Let's go through the other settings that I have. I shoot raw <laughs> and I actually shoot raw compressed. You can do the raw plus JPEG and whatnot, but I found that it's a little bit tedious because when I dump the SD card onto the computer, it, it all of a sudden you have like these doubles. You have the raw and you have the JPEG version and you're like, which one is the original? Is it, uh, it's just confusing when you have so many like different versions of the same picture. Basically, uh, what I do is I just shoot raw and then in Lightroom, uh, I convert it uh, to whatever the film simulation is. You can just shoot it in raw and it doesn't matter what film simulation you set it to in camera because in Lightroom, you can just pick whatever you want uh, after the fact um, and you don't have to choose right away. You can switch it to the black and white or whatever. But when you do choose a film simulation in camera and you shoot raw, 
it just kind of sets it as a default, um, but it doesn't really affect the file itself. It's just when you play it back, it'll show default to the classic Chrome look. It's kind of like white balance. You can set it to whatever you want. In the preview, it'll show that white balance, but when you shoot raw, it doesn't really matter. You can change it. And the reason why I shoot raw compressed, there's uncompressed and lossless compressed. So with compressed, you won't lose any of the data. You get just as much flexibility in terms of editing, uh, but it's a compressed file, so your file sizes will be a lot smaller. There's a disadvantage to doing compressed is when you transfer it through Finder to your computer, it won't show the thumbnails because it's compressed file format. The computer won't recognize the thumbnails from this file. And so that's kind of annoying. So you got to go through like Adobe Bridge or Lightroom to see the thumbnails. But the reason why I still shoot compressed is because it saves file size. And with this daily camera, I shoot tons of pictures. I don't want to miss moments. And so I just capture it all. And so, you know, when you're shooting thousands of pictures, you're trying to save as much space as you can. So then there's the grain effect. Uh, I keep that off because I like to do it in post if I want. Um, otherwise, I'd like clean. But again, raw, it doesn't matter. Dynamic range, auto. White balance, auto. Highlight tone, I do do a minus two. Um, again, it doesn't really matter uh, in raw, but I do minus two because uh, I like a little bit more cinematic. And by cinematic, I mean kind of moody. Uh, look to it, it tends to have a little bit lower contrast in cinematic looks. Obviously, there's many different cinematic looks. I tend to like a little bit more moody, so I like to kind of dial back the highlights. Uh, the shadow tone, uh, I'll raise it up just to kind of give it a little bit more contrast in the darks. Color, leave it sharpness a little bit sharper. Uh, noise reduction, uh, you wanna do noise reduction, just kick it down, basically because it tends to just clay or it just gets rid of all the skin texture. And so it starts to look a little bit Photoshoppy, a little bit fake. Long exposure noise reduction on. Don't really do a lot of long exposures in the camera. Color space Adobe. Um, again, it's, it's raw, so it doesn't matter, but uh, just in case I do shoot JPEG in camera, generally Adobe has more data. So if you wanna work with more to adjust later, you wanna work with the bigger playground basically. sRGB, of course, that's what it all gets converted to when you view it on the computer. You want the most data in order to edit and then you convert to sRGB at the end. Okay, so power management, I have auto off in one minute and then performance is standard. You can make it high performance and I think that might speed up some processes, but standard is just fine for me and it's a good balance for battery life. I have, it, I have this eye sensor on, so if you lift it up to your eye, it'll switch to the screen in there, um, the EVF or the OVF. But when I have it around my neck, I don't worry about it. It still shuts off after a minute, even if like this sensor is triggered. I don't really notice uh, the decrease in battery performance. And then of course you've got your Q button where you can kind of quickly access some more stuff. But again, I haven't I haven't really actually used it. I don't even think about it. I kind of just set it and forget it. If you followed all the instructional material, you just set it and forget it. That's why this is such a good camera. Once you dial in your settings, all I do basically is I just turn it on and shoot. Good to go.